Hello YouTubes and welcome back to Tully's Marine Tales. For those who don't know, I'm a marine biologist and on this channel we cover all things ocean related and for this series in particular, which has been going on for a while now, we cover kind of like ocean news stories, marine biology discoveries, conservation wins or losses, and I still really need your help. I'm trying to figure out exactly what to call this type of um, video that I'm making. I don't know, ocean news, marine science news, ocean stories, marine biology discoveries, ocean discoveries. Like if you had to search for this type of content, what would you put in the search bar? Please help me out. Let's brainstorm down in the comments below. I really need your help. Now onto our first news story. It has one that's been doing the rounds and it's made it into all of the major news outlets and that's because anything to do with great white sharks always makes it into the news but even I will admit that this is a really cool story and it's about the first ever baby great white shark to be seen in the wild. Now it was seen on a drone um, caught by the Malibu artist. You might have seen some of his footage here on YouTube. He has some incredible footage and this is just one example of that. Now as cool as I think this is, I mean a baby great white shark is pretty cool. I think what is most interesting about the story is what it's not telling us versus what it is telling us. And what I mean by this is it just really highlights how little we know about the ocean and ocean animals, especially when we compare it to land animals. I mean, you think of all those documentaries that we've been watching for decades, like since I was a kid, when it's all about the pride of African lions and the scientists know so much about them. It's kind of like watching a soap opera of their lives. And there goes Lucy, the lioness cub that was born exactly 172 days ago under the baobab tree that generations before her have been born under. And Lucy appears to be leaving her mother's side for the first time in her entire life. You know, she's reaching that age that all cubs do where they have to gain a bit of independence. And there she goes, seeking a reassuring hug from her aunt Nala as she goes on her first ever hunt. I mean, can you imagine if we had that kind of detail into how sharks live their lives? It would be incredible, but no, we're seeing a baby shark in the wild for the first time. And this is arguably on one of the world's most studied shark species. We have countless scientists across the world studying great white sharks for many, many years. There are over 500 species of sharks and we know even less about the rest of them than we do about the great white shark. And I just, you know, sometimes I think to myself, I, I knew ever since I was a kid that I wanted to grow up and be a marine biologist. And I remember sitting and thinking, oh, by the time I get there, you know, there's going to be nothing left for me to study because we're going to know it all. But the further you go down the marine biology rabbit hole, the more you realize how little we actually know. Anyway, it's a groundbreaking sighting from the Malibu artist. I have heard some murmurings from some scientists who are asking whether it's really, 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 really a newborn great white shark. But I think the general consensus is that it is. And I think it's pretty convincing. You have this all white, really small great white shark. It's sloughing off some kind of stuff that is arguably its embryonic layer. So it's pretty convincing. It's really cool. It has conservation ramifications. You know, we need to know where these important habitats are for this vulnerable species. So very cool story. And perhaps you might not be convinced that a baby great white shark is cute, but I wanted to end off the story on what I think is a truly cute baby shark. It's a baby puff at a shy shark. It's an endemic species here in South Africa. It hatched out of an egg case that we saved off of the beach. And tell me, do you not think this is a really cute baby shark? Now our next story is still sharky, but we're going even bigger than the great white shark and we're talking Megalodon. Yes, it is extinct. No, there's no way it could still be swimming around in the deep ocean. Yes, it is 100% extinct. But this story is basically about fat shaming the Megalodon. Now we don't really know exactly what the Megalodon used to look like because we don't have a complete skeleton of a Megalodon because 
Fun fact, a shark skeleton is made out of cartilage and not bone, which doesn't fossilize so well. So we only have a couple of vertebrae and teeth that paleontologists and scientists have used to reconstruct what they think the megalodon would have looked like. And as it currently stands, we have two competing research teams with two competing theories. And in the left corner of the ring, we have Cooper et al. leading the research team from the UK, getting into the ring first and landing the first punch, stating that the Megalodon would have been similar in shape to the Great White Shark, that is, to politely say, stocky, just on a much bigger scale. And in the right corner, we have Stones et al. leading the research team from the USA, landing a return punch, stating that this is a silly idea. Because of how much space the vertebra would have needed for the Megalodon, it would have been the dieting version of the Great White Shark, being a much slimmer and slender version. And back to Cooper et al. seemingly unfazed by the opposition, landing the final punch, stating that this is preposterous and that this proposal suffers from circular logic. Oh. Hyperbole aside, as much as science is a useful tool for understanding the world around us, it is by no means perfect and every now and then we do get a healthy scientific debate over a particular topic, like for example, whether the megalodon would have been stocky or slim. And in my personal opinion, I do feel that this debate is a little bit of a waste of time. Hot take, I know, surely as a scientist, I should think that all lines of scientific inquiry are important. Well, when you're debating whether a long extinct species was stocky or slim, I don't really care. Do you guys care? Let me know down in the comments below. Now I think the next story is much more interesting because while it still centers around controversy and a bit of debate, there is much more real world applicability and consequences to it. And it's a story about this last ditch attempt to save a dying ecosystem. Now, you guys all know that our coral reefs are in a lot of trouble. We've spoken about it on this channel. It's always in the news. We know climate change equals warming oceans equals coral bleaching equals coral dying. Um, but there is one system in particular that has had it quite bad. And those are the Caribbean coral reefs. Now, these reefs have been dying for decades. I think the estimate is something like 80% of them have died in the last two decades. So they're really in a lot of trouble. And the intense marine heat wave that they had in the region last year was almost kind of like a final nail in the coffin for these reefs. So scientists and conservationists are considering all ideas when it comes to trying to save these coral reefs. And recently a fairly controversial and radical idea has entered into the mix. And the idea involves sort of transplanting non-native corals from another part of the world that have been shown to be more resilient to heat and the effects of climate change into the Caribbean. Now, at first this might not seem so radical. I mean, if you have corals that can survive in the Caribbean and perform the same ecological role, I mean, surely that's a good thing, right? Well, it's a lot more complicated than that because traditionally, when you introduce an invasive species into an ecosystem, it has unpredictable and oftentimes disastrous consequences. We only need to think of examples like big oak trees being introduced into water scarce regions and using up all of the water in the water table leaving none left for the native species or cats being introduced onto island systems and completely decimating the seabird population because these birds have no defenses against predators like that or big game fish like bass being introduced into rivers and dams for fishing sport but it's places where they've never been before and they completely take over the ecosystem because they don't have any predators and they outcompete or kill the native fish. So traditionally, invasive species have been understood to be really bad for ecosystems. So when you're thinking about transplanting essentially invasive corals into the Caribbean coral reefs, it is a pretty radical idea. And now this idea is nowhere near being approved or reaching a general consensus or receiving funding or going ahead or anything like that but i think it just goes to show how desperate these scientists and conservationists are to try and do something to save these corals instead of just standing by and watching a vibrant colorful 
super important ecosystem fade into a ghostly white death. And on that happy note, I'm afraid to say our final story is not much better and actually just makes my blood boil. Norway is up to its nonsense again, and as one of the wealthiest countries in the world, it still seems to have no shame in extracting more and more resources at the peril of its underwater ecosystems. Norway has become the first country to allow the controversial practice of deep sea mining for minerals along its continental shelf. Against all advice from its scientists, environmental agencies, even its own Norwegian environmental agency said this isn't a good idea, but hey ho, in January, their parliament voted 80-20 in favor of exploratory deep sea mining to see if they could extract certain minerals from their seabed profitably. Now, the argument that all proponents of deep sea mining make, including the Norwegian government, is that we need to mine these minerals from the ocean floor in order to uh, make batteries for electric vehicles and other electronics to help support the transition into a low carbon world. Now you can see what they've done there. They've used the eco-friendly argument of transitioning to a low carbon world and having a lower carbon footprint to justify the destruction of entire ecosystems. Now that's circular reasoning if I ever heard it. And it's also all lies because there are a lot of scientists who say that there are enough mineral resources on land to support this transition to a low carbon world. We don't need to dig them up out of the sea. And the reason that scientists and environmental agencies are so against deep sea mining is because these ecosystems are so fragile and we really just know nothing about them. But we do know that they're slow to change, slow to adapt, and if we do this deep sea mining thing, we would definitely be destroying and smothering these ecosystems and there's a very high likelihood that they would not recover. But as we've seen with the whole commercial whaling debate that we did last year, Norway is very happy to ignore international standards and norms, ignore advice from scientists and just go ahead and exploit, exploit, exploit. Yeah, I don't know. I couldn't put it better than one advocate who said that this is about greed, not need, and will come at a significant cost to our environment for present and future generations. Well, that's it for today, my friends. A whirlwind tour through the current state of what is happening in our oceans. Let me know down in the comments below what you think of these stories, and I'll see you in the next video.